please uh, have your Bible open there at Malachi if you've got it there. And uh, that's the first five verses we're going to be looking at together this morning. I'm not a great fan of Selena Gomez. In fact, I don't really know much about her. Uh, but I know that she has a song called Same Old Love. And in that song, there is this line. Uh, you've heard it all before. She's heard it all before at least a million times. Times. You know, I've heard it all before. Maybe that's how we might feel too uh, when we come to Malachi's prophecy here at the end of the Old Testament. There are so many prophets. Malachi is at the end of 12 of the writings of the prophets. And then there's Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel and Ezekiel and those other ones back there further as well. There are so many prophets and frankly we might say it could be said the, the message seems to be, well, same, same. We could perhaps think we've heard it all before uh, at least a million times. Well, let's just hold that thought. Let's just hold that thought uh, for a moment. Let me tell you about a preacher, a preacher who went to a new church. He arrived in his new church and on the first Sunday he delivered the sermon and he called it Living the Christian Life. Fair enough. Uh, on the second week... The preacher stood up and he gave the exact same message. And the people thought, well, that's, that's good. It's good to be reminded of the way to live for Jesus. But when the very same words came tumbling out of him the third week and then the fourth week, they began to get a bit weary of these recurring repeat performances. Maybe you can hear the groans or, uh, even now. After the fifth time in a row, it all got a bit much and one of the members plucked up the courage to ask, why have we not moved on to another text or, or to another subject? And with a bit of a wry smile, uh, the preacher said, well, I haven't noticed that the congregation has been putting the first message into practice yet. Well, it's true, isn't it? Sometimes people can be very slow to learn and act. And I don't point the finger anywhere, but at myself in that regard. It's sometimes very hard for us to learn and to act upon what we learn. It was the case for the people of Israel in Malachi's time and it's like that for many today as well. We hear the word of God but sometimes we have great difficulty putting what's said into practice. And over time it's entirely possible, in fact sometimes it's really easy sadly for us to lapse back into old ways that we should have been leaving far behind long ago. That is why we need to hear the same, same, life-giving, challenging and preserving word of God uh, that addresses us again and again so that we are freshly listening, freshly hearing what God our Father tells us is right and good and holy and true. We, we need to hear this message, this same, same message of the prophets, so that we're not taken advantage of by that first thought of ours, that potential thought that we've heard it all before at least a million times. We need to hear this word freshly so that we understand how that idea, we've heard it all before, that's not helpful at all. We need to hear, hear it freshly, this word, so that we ditch the performance mentality that so often creeps into our lives. I've got to get up to this sort of standard and match up to this person, keep up with the Joneses, so to speak. Sorry, Sarah, that just came out. <laughs> and stop. Oh, dear. And give ourselves to humbly doing what the Lord, our God, says. So who's Malachi? We're hearing about his message. Who is he? What's his testimony all about? Well, he's the last in what we might call a long line of, of mouthpieces for God that are known uh, as the prophets. And Malachi is telling us about the awesomeness, the greatness, the glory, the majesty of the Lord God, the Lord of heaven's armies. He's telling us about the greatness, the glory and the majesty of the heavenly king and about what this heavenly king expects of us as his subjects. Malachi is setting the stage for the one whom we read later on in this prophecy, the one who will suddenly come to the people and who's to be responded to in repentance and faith. He's setting the stage for this one who's the messenger of the, the covenant of God's new great agreement with people like us. 
This one who's described as the son of righteousness with healing in his wings will come and turn the hearts of fathers to children and children's to fathers. See, Malachi is setting the stage for Jesus. This one whose day has come and whose day is coming. Jesus who secures eternal freedom from the curse of judgment on sin for all those who are trusting in his love and his mercy and his forgiveness. All those who are prepared to serve him with truth and justice, gladless, here and now. So Malachi's message is as relevant to God's people, to you and to me, uh, today, every bit as much as it was back when he first spoke God's word. This morning we're going to look at these opening words in the first five verses and in them we'll see how Malachi has a burden. This word, uh, the oracle of the word of the Lord that came to to Israel by Malachi, it's it's more literally the burden of the word of the Lord that came to Israel through Malachi. We're going to see he's got this burden. He's got a burden that's two-pronged. It's for the Lord's love and it's for the Lord's greatness. They're Malachi's burdens right here at the start. So we can get to grips with the prophet and with his message. Notice he has this great burden for the Lord's love. Verse 2, I have loved you, says the Lord. Now you might hear that phrase, I've loved you so often, but here it is God saying it and on his lips, according to his prophet, it's not something just we can easily dismiss. I've loved you, says the Lord, but here's Israel. How have you loved us? God gives them the answer, well, is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord. I, I've loved Jacob, but Esau I've, I've hated. I've laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals in the desert. Malachi's got a burden about this love of the Lord's, the Lord's love. Now, you know, as well as I do, that we can't avoid knowing when a local or a state or a federal election is, is looming, can we? Uh, we know about it because mention of the fact is made uh, in news broadcasts and current affairs programs virtually every day when an election's coming. Those times talk of election seems to almost be in the air that we are breathing. Well, the same is true about the fact of God's election. Not, not his election to Canberra or to Sydney or to Byron Street, Iso Street. <laughs> not that sort of election, but his election of people to new life. Uh, A fact that we can't escape from hearing as we read through the scriptures. It's so because as we read of his loving decree of life forevermore granted to people like us, we read about it through the whole length, the whole breadth of the Bible. This opening section of Malachi is one of those places. I've set you apart, he says. I've selected you, I've elected you, I've loved you in this particular gracious and great way. Of course, some people don't like this sort of teaching. They see it's negative, they see it's narrow, they say that's exclusive. But be encouraged to see here, as the Bible overall tells us, the overall emphasis, the overwhelming emphasis of the Scriptures is, as Malachi demonstrates to wayward Israel, that God is positive, he's gracious, his selecting is according to grace and mercy and the love that he has toward undeserving sinners. So instead of chastising his people for their lack of faithfulness, as we might have expected him to right at the start, the Lord through Malachi reminds Israel, he reminds us, of his great love for those that he's brought from darkness to light. And with those words that are tender toward those who are struggling and uncertain, Malachi acting here like a a defender, a defence attorney, if you like, for God and for his firm and committed covenant agreed love that he promised through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and right down to us today, Malachi brings a clear message that he, the Lord God over all, he has set his people apart, Uh, he keeps us, he's loved us in this special and particular way. You know, at a time when the faith of the people of God was at a very low ebb, when they were in a position of weakness and fragility, sounds a bit like today, doesn't it? Malachi's reminder of the Lord's great love for his people, it comes as a serious wake-up call, a call to remember that they, that we, are not left or going to be forsaken. Even despite 
the neglect of faith's responsibility to meet God's love with theirs, he's not writing Israel off. Even though, as we'll find detailed later on, they were failing to uphold his glory and honour, he bears with them in love. He bears with us in love. Each of us, we need to hear this crystal clear message too as we seek to love and serve the Lord who's demonstrated his love toward us in Christ who died while we were yet sinners. We mustn't ever forget as we speak and act for the Lord our God. Well, we need to remember this. His loving kindness must never be taken as a for granted thing because that's what he has to do. Not at all. We're to speak of God's love. We're to speak of what it means that it's what he chooses to do without merit on our part. And if we turn away like Esau here, you notice the descendants of Esau. You remember Esau sold his birthright for that red stew? Well, his descendants, they went further and further away from the Lord such that God says they might try to rebuild and start off again, but actually they, they banished forever. How does that work in with the love of God? It shows us that those who will not meet God's love with theirs, they they are set aside. But this love that's proclaimed to us, uh, we're to proclaim to ourselves and one another, is here leaving us in no doubt. And here or throughout the rest of this book, Malachi's burden is to urge us to remember to return, not like Esau, but like wayward Israel, to return to our first love, clearly demonstrating to us, here he is, that God tells us going down any other path would be foolish. Don't despise things like Esau did. So we've already said it's, it's in God's mercy and according to his infinite wisdom that what he began with Abraham uh, in placing himself on oath to be Abraham's God and king what he maintained in restating the promise to Isaac and Jacob, what he'll always continue to do is to love those who are his in Christ. So whether it's in this present crisis uh, or as we go through all sorts of other distresses, in good times or in bad, we need the same wide-eyed and angled view of God's love that Malachi has. That's what should spur us on. It should move us to speak of and declare his real and loving purposes to ourselves, to one another, in order to counteract this idea of how this can possibly ever be. In a world that's screaming out to us, don't love God, go your own way, God is calling to us, love me because I've loved you. Don't turn and go the way of unbelief. See, Malachi's opening words show how his message was a particular burden that he had to unpack so that any and all ideas of a lack of love on God's part, that they are banished from us. You might have heard of uh, the hymn, the song, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus, written by George Duffield. And he wrote it immediately after hearing about the death of a friend of his, Dudley Ting. Dudley died as a result of an accident on his parents' farm. And his final words were, tell all my friends, tell George to stand up for Jesus. Tell all my friends, stand up for Jesus. You know, George Duffield, he he could have been bitter about the loss of his friend. He could have asked God, how have you loved me? We could say, how have you loved us? And circumstances are hard and difficult. But he didn't do that. Instead, he pressed on. He gave us these great words, stand up, stand up for Jesus. Soldiers of the cross, don't, don't cow down but lift high the banner of his cross. Duffield pressed on. He declared the steadfast love of God that never ceases for all his people, in spite of sin, in spite of its bitter fruit. So much earlier, Malachi had done the same thing. And much, much later, we are to do the same thing, to stand up, stand up for this one who has brought God's love near to us. Knowing this, when we're faced with the choice, when you are, when I am faced with the choice, either despair or hope, we can and must hope. Do as Malachi did by promoting the testimony of the unfailing love of the Lord our God. Malachi has a burden for the love of the Lord, for the Lord's love. He also has a burden for the Lord's greatness. Have a look at verse 4. 
If Edom says we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says they may build, but I'll tear down. They will be called the wicked country, the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes, here he is speaking to God's people again, your own eyes shall see this and you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the borders of Israel. When we talk about uh, something that's a burden to us, we're usually speaking of something that's weighing heavily on our heart or on our mind, something that we're unsure how to handle or uncertain what to do about it. We've seen here there are definitely heart and mind weighty things in Malachi's burden, his message from the Lord to Israel, beyond that to us. But notice what isn't there. There's no hint of uncertainty here. Malachi knows exactly what all of God's people need to hear because God's speaking through him. And what do we need to hear? Just this, that going hand in hand with the recognition of how our God, Lord of Heaven's armies, how he's the loving Lord, going hand in hand with that is to be a corresponding grasp of how he's one who's not to be trifled with, as Esau and his descendants tried to. He is the, the sovereign one, the king over all. Now, we'd have to say, here is where people often have difficulty stomaching the Bible, where a clear and unapologetic view that God is not only loving but also just is put forward. Well, many people have trouble chewing and swallowing that. But that's what Malachi does, though. He brings these truths together as he concentrates on the utter desolation of the descendants of Esau in verse 4. He does it in conjunction with alongside of the glorious greatness of God who's beyond a geographical patch of land in his greatness. You see, no matter, no matter how much we may find it hard to wrap our minds around these things or how difficult it is for us to keep those things in tension so that we don't stray into error or into rebellion, as hard as that is, we have to, we have to do that. Keep them together. Don't divorce them don't say somehow god of the old testament is different to the god of the new testament no we have to do this by accepting the scriptures for what they are god's word to us rather than humanity's ideas about him and when we do this what becomes so much clearer what is so much clearer is that it makes the best sense of what we see going on in the world what presses in on us Hold these things together. God is holy and just, loving, true, merciful, all of that. So, though men may act defiantly towards the Lord of all, he will be the ultimate victor. He will not share his glory, but instead he will use it for the good of all of his people. See, Malachi had an overwhelming desire to uphold the Lord's character as as great, as glorious, He's willing to point to past and to present events to prove his case. Look what happened to Esau and his descendants. Look what's going on in your own life now. More of that later on. He is not the least bit apologetic, this prophet, when people pointed to contemporary events and said, well, where's God in this? He says, God's right there. He's doing this. He's in charge. Malachi tells us this so that the issue of who's in charge of the world, let alone the everyday situations of life, so that that question's settled. And so that the pointed questions that flow on from there about who to live for that are coming in the rest of the book, so that they're set in their right framework. So far from being a sort of spiritual bait and switch, what Malachi opens his prophecy with is a straightforward view, a wide-angled view, A view of the power and wonder of grace. Grace that's undeserving, uh, to quote, but never cheap. So don't miss this. Our task, yours, mine, uh, is to still today see God's glory and say to ourselves, along with all his people, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Where? Beyond Israel's borders, among the nations, as we read towards the end of chapter 1. So what do we take home out of all this? Malachi has a bold declaration here. It's a bold declaration of the steadfast love of the Lord that never ceases. 
our declaration should be bold as well. Our declaration should be a knowing, trusting and avowed one that God in faithful covenant mercy and grace loves like no one else can or will. And he loves here and now. So as we remember, as we go out into this new week, as we remember how his committed love to us is costly, not cheap, it's purpose-filled rather than fickle, and it's unmerited instead of earned, all the difference then is made in how we respond with our love for him. We're to live purposefully, thankfully, graciously. Doing so, remembering that the Lord's greatness, it's above and beyond that of every other so-called God. Remembering that he is great everywhere, not just in one particular place. That should always be a prompt. That should actually be a prod to us to be faithful like he is faithful. To be so engaged for him that people hear from us about being God's treasured possessions in the Lord Jesus and that we might see that he has done all of this so that we might be seen ourselves as those who've been with the Lord, who are with him not just for a moment but for all life and for all eternity. Have you turned to Jesus? That's Malachi's ultimate message. We come to the one who says, you'll find life in me. Life for now, life forevermore. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you that you are our strength and refuge, our present help in every time of trouble, that you have spoken so clearly is a wonder to us. Not a wonder that you could do it, but a wonder that you would. Well, Lord God, we know that your word convicts, yes, your word upholds it it trains us in the way that we ought to go and so we pray that we would not just stand and wonder but actually then hear that word and put it into practice it's not just same same but instead something that though we might have heard it so many times before it's a message for us each new day so please hear our prayer and direct us in your praise and worship and honor that we might live purposefully graciously, fully for you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.